everyone, take your Bibles. Let's turn to John chapter 1. John chapter 1. We're going to look at the first five verses of this wonderful gospel. It's interesting how each of the gospel writers uh, begin uh, their, their books, their, their gospels. Uh, Matthew and Luke uh, begin their accounts uh, with uh, the, the birth of Jesus. Uh, of course, we're very familiar with Luke's account of, of his birth. We read it together almost every year at Christmas time. Uh, Mark begins his gospel <clears throat> with Jesus' baptism, uh, the beginning of his public ministry. John, however, begins his gospel with Jesus at the beginning, uh, not, not, not his beginning in terms of his life on earth, but the beginning. Uh, long before this world uh, existed, I've always been told that if you're going to tell a good story, it's best to begin at the beginning, and that's indeed what John uh, does here uh, in his gospel. So I'm going to ask you, if you would, let's stand together and let's read these first five verses if you don't have a Bible. Or a device, uh, you can read along. Uh, the words will be here on that beautiful, crisp, clear screen uh, at the front. Yes, looks so nice. Very happy about that. John chapter 1, beginning in verse 1, says this. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him. And without him, not anything made was made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Let's pray. Let's pray together. Father, we are so thankful today for your word. And Father, especially thankful for the living word of God, Jesus Christ. Lord, we thank you for the salvation that he has brought into this world and that we, as your children, are so blessed to enjoy each and every day. And again, Father, I pray if there's someone here, someone listening, someone watching that has never experienced the salvation that comes only from Jesus, I pray that at some point this morning, throughout the course of this message, you will open their eyes to the reality of their greatest need. Draw them to yourself and save them. So, Lord, we thank you for who you are, for what you do, for what you are doing. And we pray that, uh, again, this service would bring honor and glory to you. And we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. The Word of God. Of course, we know that John is referring to Jesus Christ, uh, the Son of God, the the, 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 the logos, and that's really the word that is used here. The, those words in the beginning was the word. That's the Greek word logos that some of us, many of us perhaps, are familiar with. To the Greeks who heard this letter read perhaps for the first time, those words or that word, the logos, uh, to them uh, indicated the, the controlling principle uh, behind all matter that, that held the universe together. That's what they would think of when they heard that word. And of course, John is letting them know at that, this point that, that that controlling principle is, is not just a principle, as we'll see in a moment. It's a person. It's the person of Jesus Christ. He is the one who holds all the universe together. You know, the Greek philosopher who lived uh, 400 years before Jesus was ever born <clears throat> once said this, he said, it may be that someday there will come forth from God a word, a logos, who will reveal all mysteries and make everything plain. Of course, John tells us here that that logos is indeed Jesus Christ, uh, God's Son. The writer of Hebrews is the one that said that Jesus is the one who upholds the universe by the word of his power. So, in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. Now, 
very first thing I want to deal with here is those words, in the beginning. And of course, that's the very same words, of course, in Greek rather than in Hebrew, that, that Genesis 1.1 begins with. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, Genesis 1.1. And here in John 1.1, in the beginning was the word. And the beginning that we are talking about here is what we might refer to as the ultimate beginning. A beginning that took place, well, it really didn't take place at all. It just always was. Before there was ever a universe, before there was ever anything that we have experienced of this creation, there was the Word. Uh, in the beginning was the Word. And it's very important that we understand uh, that word was, was the Word. It, 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 there's so much meaning there. Grammatically, in the, in the Greek language, that word was indicates a continuous state in the past. So what John is saying is that the word was in existence and was continuing in this existence long before the universe ever existed. In the beginning, of course, we have often, I, I know when I preached through Genesis years ago, I, I think I said something along the lines that that word in the beginning means in the beginning of the beginning of the beginning. And you could just keep going on and on with that because it was in eternity past. And so this word of God, God the Son, Jesus, uh, he was there in the beginning Sometimes we lose sight of that. We get so wrapped up or keyed in upon the birth of Jesus Christ, and rightfully so. Uh, God the Son has existed throughout all eternity. In the beginning, he was there, continuing as the Word. There was never a time when God's Son, the living Word, did not exist. And, of course, as I mentioned just a moment ago, unlike what the philosophers, Plato and Socrates and others, thought, this logos, this word, was not just some principle, some uh, force, uh, but rather was a, a person, the person of Jesus Christ, the second person of the Trinity. Uh, the idea behind that phrase, and the word was with God, uh, we might even translate those words, and the word was face to face with God, implying equality. Again, I think that's something else that we don't always get exactly right in our, our thinking. And again, as I've said over the years, we sometimes tend to, to line things up with God the Father up here, God the Son a little bit below Him, God the Holy Spirit a little bit below Him, but that's not at all the way we ought to line those things up. They are, they are co-equal, co-eternal. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. That's what John is saying to us here. The Word was with God, face to face with God throughout all eternity. And again, even though he doesn't mention the Holy Spirit here, he was there as well. In this continuing harmonious relationship from before the beginning of time, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit eternally and equally face to face. The Word was with God. And of course, the Word was God. And John so much wants to emphasize this idea that Jesus Christ, the Word of God, was indeed God. That that last phrase, even though it's translated in our English Bibles as the, the Word was with God, and the Word was God, in the Greek it says, and God was the Word. Jesus Christ was God. The Word was God. Uh, it's important that we understand that. Jesus has always been God. Uh, he wasn't exalted to a position of deity. He always was divine uh, from eternity past, and he will be well into eternity future. So this word of God, this logos that John begins to talk about here, he wants us to know he has always existed. There's never been a time when the word of God, the Son of God, did not exist. There has never been a time when the Word of God, the Son of God, was not truly and completely God, co-equal, co-eternal with the Father. That's how we should think of Jesus Christ when we think of Him, always in existence from the beginning of the beginning of the 
beginning. And then in verse 2, he begins to talk about the work that God does. He says, he, meaning the word, Jesus, the Son of God, he was in the beginning with God. So he, he restates, and again, anytime you see a repetition in Scripture, as we've, as we've said, it, it, it should cause us to, to know that the writer is emphasizing a particular point here. And that's indeed what John is doing. He is, he is emphasizing the fact that Jesus was always co-eternal, always co-equal with the Father. Again, when we read those words in Genesis 1-1, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, we are to understand that God the Son was indeed there with God the Father and God the Holy Spirit. Uh, love to talk about uh, the resurrection and the exaltation of Christ. Christ ascending into heaven, taking his seat at the right hand of the throne of God, that position of power and authority. But the reality is that from eternity past, Christ has held this exalted position. Uh, it wasn't something that he came into lately. Uh, he has always been God. He has always been the Word. He has always been God the Son, powerful, exalted, uh, very beginning, all of them there together, uh, cooperating in perfect harmony to bring about the purposes and the plans of God. And of course, it tells us a little bit about his power. When, when the biblical writers think of the power of God, almost without exception, they all go back to creation. The, perhaps the greatest display uh, of God's power, save the cross, uh, ever, ever. Creation. And of course, John does that here. He was in the beginning with God. And look at verse 3. And all things were made through him. And without him was not anything made that was made. Again, this emphasis, this, this, this repetitive language letting us know that when we look at the world in which we live, you know who created it, you know who made it? God the Son, the Word of God. Uh, that's who made it. It was the Word by which the universe was created. Uh, Paul makes it absolutely clear for us in Colossians chapter 1, verses 16 and 17, when he writes this. He says, for by him, referring to Jesus, for by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him. And of course, Paul adds, and for him. And I, and, I, and I want to emphasize that this morning as we think about Jesus being the creator of the universe, that all things were made through him, that there wasn't a single thing made that he didn't make. When we think of our own existence, that we are here because God the Son, the Word of God, created us. He made us. He made us for himself. So important that we understand that. So many people go through life uh, without uh, any real sense of significance. As a matter of fact, just the opposite. I, I believe most people in the world are searching for significance. Uh, they're, they're, they're trying to find out why they're here and, and, and what their life is to be all about. And, and most aren't looking in the right place. They're not looking to the one that can give their life a sense of significance. They're, they're looking to the world to give them a sense of significance and worth. And you're, you're never going to find it if that's where you're looking. Look to Jesus Christ. Suddenly, your life is filled with significance. You were made by him and you were made for him. Jesus Christ made you for himself. I mean, that's a staggering thought. So the question we have to ask ourselves is this. Am I living my life for the one that made me and made me for himself? You know, the Bible says that as Christians, we should no longer live for ourselves, but for the one who loved us gave himself for us. Jesus created everything in this universe, and it is a vast and diverse universe, a universe filled with beauty and wonder. Uh, we're part of that universe, and he made all of this beauty and wonder, which we're a part, for himself. I, I pray that you are conscious of that each and every day. And that you are determined to live your life for the one who made you and, and saved you. All things were made through him. And then 
John begins to talk about the will of God. You know, sometimes we wonder about what God's will is. We, we often are not completely certain about what God's will for our own lives is. But let me tell you, God has a will for your life. He has a will for the life of this church. God has purposes and plans that he has set in place, good works that he has, he has created for us to walk in. God has a, a will, and, and his purpose, John says here, it says, in him was life. Again, we're still talking about the word of God. God the, the Son, in him was life. And what we need to understand, again, when we think of Jesus, is that Jesus is and always has been the source of all life, both physical and spiritual. I mean, I, I, again, I think we think of Jesus being the source of spiritual life, but he's the source of all life, every bit of it. And, and in John chapter 5, if we skipped ahead a little bit, verse 26, Jesus says this. He says, For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son to have life in himself. Later, in John 10, 10, Jesus said of himself, he says, I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. Jesus came into this world so that you might have life. And, and not just life, but life in abundance. Um, we talked about the fact that eternal life is not just a, a, a quantity of life. It's not just an, an endless life. If you talk to a lot of people in the world, they don't want their life to go on forever. Those of us who know Jesus Christ, who know the wonder and the glory, the abundance of life in Christ, eternal life is a beautiful thought, isn't it? Jesus came that we might have life and have it abundantly. And, of course, we live in a world that is just the opposite of that. The world's a place of death and dying, is it not? I mean, all around us. I mean, we hear about it every day, and it seems increasingly so. It doesn't seem like there's a single newscast these days where we don't hear of some mass shooting, some shooting in a school, somebody being killed. Death and darkness are, are just all around us. But we need to remember that Jesus Christ came into the world, and what did he do when he died on the cross and rose from the grave? He conquered death. He conquered death. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 15, 54, death is swallowed up victory. For us who know Christ, that's a reality for us. I mean, because the reality is one day we're all going to die, right? It's appointed, the Bible says, for all men once to die. Jesus has conquered death. He's conquered death for us. The privilege, just a, a few uh, days ago to visit uh, a man named Pat in the hospital. And I had heard that Pat had all kinds of health issues and that his doctors had determined that because of his age and his ongoing issues that the one surgery that they thought might extend his life a little bit was, uh, was not even an option for Pat. And so the decision was that he would go home on hospice care and that his life would be brief. And as a matter of fact, Pat passed away just a few days ago. But there in that hospital room, as I sat down next to Pat's bed, I, I said to him, I expressed my, my sorrow. I said, I'm, I'm sure sorry to hear that, that the surgery is not an option for you. And he said, you know, I'm not. He said, I've just kind of accepted it. He said, you know, I've, I've had a long life. I mean, Pat was well into his 80s. He said, I've had a long life. I've got to do a lot of things. I've got lots of great memories. I'm, I'm ready for whatever comes next. And I said, well, you know, Pat, that's a, that's a wonderful way, you know, wonderful attitude to have in light of your current situation, you know, I'm so thankful that you have this wonderful past that you can look back on and it gives you comfort. I said, but would you mind if I ask you a personal question? He said, no, go ahead. I said, what about your future? And of course, he said, well, I hope that I can just go home and, and get through these next few weeks as comfortably as possible. I said, no, 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 I'm not, I'm not talking about that future. I'm talking about your future beyond that. I said, the Bible speaks of eternity, heaven, uh, hope comfort in, in knowing that when our life ends on this earth, there is yet a greater, better, more glorious life ahead of us. He looked at me and he said, can you give me that kind of hope? I said, no, Pat, I can't. I said, but I know who can. 
name is Jesus. And I said, and the Bible says if you'll call upon his name, he'll save you. And I had heard that Pat, uh, there were lots of people praying for him, witnessing to him. Uh, one lady in church had even asked him uh, to share his testimony. Pat said, I, I, I don't have a testimony. And, and he didn't. There in that hospital bed, he looked at me and he said, would you, would you lead me in a prayer? And so I had the privilege of leading Pat in a prayer of salvation. Uh, let me tell you, Pat has a testimony now. The wonderful thing to know that in Christ there is life, life abundant, that death in Christ is swallowed up in victory. That was the very purpose for which God sent his son into the world, to seek and to save that which was lost. And of course, he goes on to say here, and the life was the light of men. You see, not only did God's Son come into the world to save us, but he came into the world, again, to give us this abundant life. Most of us, when we hear that word testimony, we rightfully think about the, 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 the moments surrounding our salvation experience. That's often what we do. And when you're asked to share your testimony, you automatically begin to think about the day that you were saved or the circumstances in which you were saved. And that's a great thing to be able to share that with people, how, how God called you out of darkness into light, how he changed your life forever. That's a wonderful thing. But, you know, our testimony doesn't stop there. It continues right up to this very moment. What's your testimony today? What, what would you uh, bear witness to if called upon to do so uh, in a court of law that, that Jesus is doing for you today? The life that we have in Christ is also the light of our lives. Jesus came to save us, but also to, to, to provide for us throughout this life and really into the next Life. He came to open our eyes to the truth, to righteousness. I don't know about you, but I know for me, when I became a Christian, everything in my life changed. I had a whole new direction. The Word of God suddenly became alive to me. As, as Psalm 119, 105 says, it suddenly became a, a, a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. I wanted to know what God's Word said. I still want to know what it says and, and where it's leading me and guiding me and how it's changing me every day. That's, that's what the Word of God is for. Again, that's what it means there when John says in this life that was in Christ is the light of men. Jesus Christ is the answer to man's greatest problems. You know, every day, again, you can turn on the news, and, and our government officials and government leaders throughout the world, they're all looking for solutions to their problems, right? Let me tell you, the solutions to our problems are found in Jesus Christ. In Jesus Christ, he gives meaning and significance to life. He enables us to live the life that we were created to live, and he guides us each step of the way through his word, through the indwelling spirit of Christ in us. Church, it's a wonderful thing that God has done for us in saving us. Uh, not just this wonderful blessing of knowing that heaven is our home and that one day when this life is over, we've got this wonderful future still ahead of us, but knowing that each day of this life, in spite of the dark, sinful world in which we live, we can have joy. We can have peace. We can have strength. We can have fellowship. We can serve and minister alongside of one another. We can pray and bring comfort to one another. God has given us this wonderful, abundant life to be lived and experienced right now. We're not just waiting to experience the glory of God. God's glory should be experienced in our lives in an ever-increasing way, day by day by day. That's the will of God for your life. And, of course, the wonderful thing is that God is still at work in this world. Look at verse 5. It says, the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Aren't you glad that the darkness has not overcome the light? The light shines. It shines in the darkness. What's that mean? Well, it means that, that, that the word of God 
who was in the beginning with God, who was God and was with God, that he's still with us. His presence is still being manifested in this world. And you know, one of the main ways that God manifests his presence in this world is through you. I mean, you want to talk about significance of life. God manifests his presence to the world through you. That's his desire. God wants people to see Jesus in you. I mean, the Apostle Paul was able to say, look, imitate me. Because my goal is to be an imitator of Christ. That ought to be our way of living as well. We ought to think those same thoughts. God desires that people see him through us. God is present in this world through his church. Again, it ought to comfort us today to know that, you know, when Jesus went back to heaven, God didn't remove himself from this world. God is still here. Again, he is in us through the person of the Holy Spirit, right? God is still present. He is omnipresent. That's one of the great attributes of God. God is everywhere. He's not just seated on a throne wherever heaven is. He's here. He's here with us now. The Bible says where two or three of us gather together in his name, there he is in our midst. Think about that for a moment. God is here right this second. He shines in the darkness. And I don't know what kind of darkness has characterized your life lately. What kind of difficulties you're experiencing. We all go through them, don't we? In those days of difficulty, remember, God is here. He is present. His light is shining in the darkness. Jesus said in John 8, 12, he said, I'm the light of the world, and whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. What a wonderful promise, huh? Yeah, this world's a dark place. Yeah, it's a dangerous place. It's a wicked place. But if we follow Jesus, we won't walk in the darkness. We'll walk in the light just as he is in the light. We will have the light of life. You know, one of the things that often comes up in witnessing situations is someone will ask, why, why do you believe what you believe? Why do you think Jesus is, is the Savior? Well, I, I mean, after all these years, isn't that, isn't that some ancient teaching? It, it, let me tell you, there's great proof, empirical proof, evidence that Jesus is who he claims to be. I mean, and John just simply states it here that the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. You know, from the day that Jesus was born, the world has tried to eliminate him. And, and there, there are forces at work in this world that are still trying to eliminate God from the world, uh, to eliminate the Word of God from our culture. Uh, we see it happening all around us. The prophet Isaiah foretold this. He said of Jesus, he was despised and rejected by men. And all around the world today, Jesus is despised and rejected by men. But the darkness has not overcome the word. You know, why do you think men would despise and reject Jesus? I mean, what did Jesus ever do that was worthy of, of our despise or our, our rejection? I mean, all he did was love us and sacrificially give himself for us. I mean, why would anyone reject Jesus? Well, John tells us in chapter 3, verse 19, he says this, The light has come into the world. And the people loved darkness rather than the light because their deeds were evil. People love darkness rather than light. People choose to reject Jesus rather than receive Jesus because their deeds are evil. I was one of those people who for a long, long time rejected Christ. I heard the gospel. I rejected it. I wanted to live life my way. I wanted to remain in the darkness. Jesus opened my eyes to my great need. He shined his light into my darkness and called me out of that darkness to himself. And that's what John is saying that he will do for you. The light has come into the world.
People love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. You know, I'm thankful for the verse, just a few verses before that one, John 3, 16. There, John tells us this. He says, For God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. In spite of the fact that the world loves darkness rather than light because of its evil deeds, God's love for the world is far greater than, than our love for darkness. Again, God's love overcomes our love for darkness. He'll overcome that love for darkness in your life. He'll save you this morning. Again, the Bible says, whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. God is more powerful than the darkness, and his grace is greater than any sin that you have ever committed or ever will commit. You know that, don't you, Christians? The sins that God forgave aren't just the sins that you committed before you came to Christ. I think sometimes we really worry about that. We, we are completely at ease with the fact that God has forgiven all of our sins prior to our coming to Christ. But what about those sins that we've committed today? Those sins are forgiven too. He forgave all your sins, past, present, future. God's grace is greater than your sin. So what should we do? What would John call us to do? To repent of our sin to receive Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. And that's what I would call you to do today.